Welcome back to another episode, episode four of Taking Inventory. I'm Daniel Druger. And I'm James Barrow. And before we jump into it, remember to like, subscribe to the pod, and follow us on Twitter at WickMarketHQ. This week, we've got a really fun agenda. We're going to be talking about the takeaways from the Luma Digital Summit, which James was, was attending this week. We're going to be talking about how AI is invading marketing and of what to expect as more and more companies start to compete in that space. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the race for data, how more and more companies are racing to acquire data to try to build a walled garden and a sustainable ad platform. But James, let's dive right in. This week, you were at the Luma Digital Media Summit. What is the Digital Media Summit? And like, I know it was a long jam-packed agenda with a lot of, as you said, like thought leaders. What were some of the, the takeaways that you had? Yeah, so Luma is the you know, leading investment bank when it comes to ad tech, marketing tech, and kind of all things sort of media monetization in a lot of ways. So they brought together kind of all sides, so like the vendor side and the supply side and the lead marketers. And, you know, it was that, like I said, it was a pretty, pretty intense agenda, but I mean, the big takeaway which isn't like a huge surprise, but it's definitely a story that isn't isn't going away. Is you know, retail media, commerce media, is going to be the future of what everyone talks about. And you know, it's not necessarily even because of like how successful Amazon has been. It, it, it actually comes back to a lot of things that Andrew Gabato was talking to us about last week, where you know, no one has access to really reliable third party data anymore because of all the privacy changes. So all of these retailers have like very, very good first party data and they're just trying to figure out how they can go ahead and monetize it and effectively sell it. I mean, if you want to be honest about it. So that was kind of like the big things that I heard at least. Was, were there any companies there that like you thought stood out as, as doing really well or kind of, uh, how was, how did people kind of react to, to that being kind of one of the, the key topics? Yeah, I, I thought, and I think this is, at least it was surprising to me, like Kroger, I mean, everyone loves Amazon and that's very clear that like they're the winner right now, but I would say like the second most popular <laughs> retail media player there was Kroger. I think everyone is starting to understand that their loyalty program is extremely good. They basically, I think that the numbers they're talking about is like they have a 96% match rate when they are, you know, doing custom audiences and, and running um, off network campaigns. And so like, what that really means is they have just like an amazing coverage of real people's identity in the U S and like, you know, Kroger is one of those companies where I think, you know, I don't think most people five years ago would have thought that they're like the bleeding edge of ad tech, but you leave that summit and you look at, at Kroger in a much different way than I think when you, when you show up there. Yeah. When you, when you told me Kroger, it was not, it was not the, the company I expected when you say Amazon and you know, XYZ are the two leaders in that space. But you know, as somebody who shops at some Kroger brands, they've got a lot of data on me. Not much. Okay, anything else on, you know, whether related to data or kind of any others, any other topics that, that kind of resonated while you were there? Yeah, I mean, I think this is like more like a macro thing, but, you know, Mouiwa was talking about all the deals they did over the last few years in terms of M&A. And then I think they said that they've done none this year. So, you know, the consolidation within the space is slowing down. You kind of feel like it's going to start picking back up now because of all the AI stuff. But, you know, it's definitely like, it, even though, you know, these retail media networks and, you know, commerce media platforms are starting to gain a lot of traction, there there has not been sort of an appetite for deal making quite yet. And I think that, is going to be important because there's no way, you know, I think as awesome as Kroger is, it's just like, are they really going to build their entire ad stack? Like I, my assumption is they keep buying more stuff over time. Yeah. And as you said, on the M&A side, I think like the introduction of AI and how quickly that's being adopted into different tech, I'm sure plays a, plays a role in, in, you know, companies wanting to see how that space plays out. I know we've talked about it at length, but a lot of different companies incorporating it into, uh, we were talking about a credit card that incorporated AI to improve their service. A lot of influencer platforms, media buying platforms, all are trying to do different 
different kind of angles of, of AI and a corporation, but I think over the last few weeks, you know, there has been this, and maybe this is a good segue, but there has been this kind of race to, to incorporate AI into advertising. I think Google, Meta, and Amazon are kind of the three in that space that have come out with a, a slew of announcements, either them investing in it or actual products that are coming out. Maybe we, let's start with Meta's announcement of their AI sandbox, a place to test a new AI-powered ad tools, creating text variants, backgrounds, image, cropping, things of that nature. Like, I know we, you and I have seen a lot in that space over the years, just how they've invested on the creative side, but like, what do you think this signals from, from Meta on the AI side and, and what do you think advertisers should be on the look for? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Meta is going to crush it at this. I think they're already like, and we've talked about this pre earnings and then post earnings. It's clear like Facebook's back. Like these guys have it absolutely under control. It's not perfect, but they're, they're definitely getting there. And this is just another example. I mean, if you've seen is Zuckerberg posts a bunch of examples of their models that I don't think even half of them are being used in this AI sandbox, but they are very quickly getting to a point where like they're just as they're just as formidable when it comes to AI as Google or even OpenAI. And they have, along with Google, have an extremely real incentive to make it easier for marketers to spend money and for those ads to work. And so this is just another example of it. You know, I think, you know, pure play creative AI tools are going to get commoditized really fast by this. Like Facebook is very good at it. They're open sourcing a lot of the the models that they're using as well. So yeah, I think it has like an impact on the space for an advertiser. It's going to be awesome. You know, a year from now, you're going to go into Facebook and say, you want some video of something for your brand and it's going to spit it out you're probably going to have no idea why it made that that distinction. And, and there's probably like a, a weird arbitrage that's happening behind the scenes against you. But but I think it will be extremely effective. And I think, you know, Facebook's going to be a pretty big winner from all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, it also seems like this is just such a, a leveling of the playing field of like, you know, big brands have always had access to, creative agencies to do creative iterations, to do a lot of testing in that space. And many smaller brands have, have been hampered by kind of the financial costs associated with that or the time investment. But like you said, like if you can, if you can spin up creative uh, immediately and test it immediately and then try a bunch of variations and meta does this back on your behalf, like uh, that closes the gap from, you know, a Shopify seller with two people and a big brand that that's got a full team and a media agency on, on the side. Yeah. And, and the other thing that, you know, Facebook's doing, and we've talked about this on, on previous episodes of this, but they're requiring advertisers to start setting up basically Facebook shops. So you think about now that they're going to have the signal on the transaction, they're going to have their own AI models that are getting better and better. You know, they are, if you kind of look at maybe like the Kroger example, you know, two years from now, I think we're going to say Facebook's the kind of leading, leading reach out media network in a weird way because, you know, they have billions of people, you know, it's like, well, it's like you know, a quarter of the world or something like that is on a Facebook service. So, you know, it's going to make, it's going to make some of these like current leaders look, look smaller, <laughs> like in, in comparison. And I think it's going to be really good for advertisers. I think it's going to work. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the other piece of that, right, is, is I think it's moving to Google. And, you know, they're, they're not slowing down on this side either. And I think between Meta, between Google, there, there's a lot of exciting things for advertisers. But Google recently had their I.O. conference and had an article titled 100 announcements and releases on, on AI, which I, I just kind of laughed about because there's some product marketing manager over there that like, I had to curate this list of 100 announcements, not 101, not 99, but 100 specific. And now they're going to do another event specifically for for Google marketing, announcing a ton of AI enhancements on next week, actually, May 23rd. But let's talk a little bit about, I mean, they've, they've signaled and kind of announced that you know, they want to incorporate this into how advertisers generate assets, how they can use it on Google search, how they can 
optimize ad campaigns, do de- different targeting. Like this space is moving pretty fast too for the world's biggest biggest search engine and ad platform. Like, do you think do you think Google and Meta kind of diverge here? Does it all converge at some point? Like, where do you think there's overlap, and where do you think maybe Google is is doing things different? I don't think there's going to be a lot of overlap. Uh, you know, I think it's just like the walled gardens are going to have taller and taller walls, I guess. Mm-hmm. And it will, it will lead to a scenario. I think where like, it's going to be very hard for you to take all the learnings that you get from Google and put them into Facebook, for example. I think they're just going to be relying on just like fundamentally different AI models. And that data is such a black box. Like, even if they were to show you the code, like no one would know what to do with it or not no one, but a lot of people. So I think it's, it's really, it's good. I think it'll be really performant. I think it's going to be, it's going to be complicated and you know, you, you probably are going to end up having marketers only be able to really focus on a few channels that are doing this really well. And if you aren't doing this, you really got to get left behind. I also think what's interesting is that, you know, we've talked a lot about this for stuff that we're building, but you know, if everything, if so, if so much of, of what matters now is what is the AI return, then, you know, as a marketer, you're, you're marketing to people, but you're marketing through AI, meaning you kind of have to start figure out how do you optimize against the AI, AI to make sure the AI picks your ads and shows it to the person. So it's a really kind of funky scenario. And we, we looked at some of these examples before about like, you know, when AI, when you ask AI to like certain AI models, at least to draw pictures of it, it doesn't return what you necessarily would think it was. Or if you look at some of the vision APIs and you show them a laptop, they may not think it's a laptop for some reason or another. And so it just creates this entire different like vector that I think marketers, brands are going to have to think about, which is how do I make sure that I'm optimizing for these models to pick me? And if I could find a way to better do that and better predict how the AI is going to perform it, it actually could give me kind of an interesting leg up. Which to me brings up an interesting question in the future is like, if, if everyone trains kind of their own models, so Meta has their models that they're using Google, Amazon, et cetera. I mean, you kind of alluded to it, but like all of these platforms essentially re-entrench themselves as the go-tos for brands. And brands are going to have to optimize that strategy for Meta specifically, for Google's models specifically, for Amazon's models specifically. And then what happens is Meta, Google, and Amazon are the three biggest channels that, that advertisers are forced to, to spend money on. And all the tier two, tier three platforms that are trying to fight for, for marketing budget I think it's squeezed out. Even if they have a good AI model, it you can only spend so much time as an advertiser or marketer on a certain number of channels. And and if Meta, Google, Amazon have the best models, are most performant, have the biggest scale, as we've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years, to me at least, it, it looks like those those three and, and the others, but the biggest ones continue to, to eat up the majority of marketing budgets and continue to lead the space. Yeah. I think the, this is probably not like a very popular opinion, but I think if you look at the sort of inevitability of like, let's just use Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook, like those ad systems are going to work. Like I've just, I will guarantee you that these, these guys will get it all figured out. And most of them already have. I think what that ends up meaning is that for like the smaller platforms and you could use like a retailer, for example. So like there's that announcement about Macy's going ahead and taking Macy's data and allowing it to be used for ad targeting across the open web. It like the, the end result I think ends up being like these smaller ad platforms. Let's just use Macy's and to kind of think about them as an ad platform for a second they're going to end up just being data brokers back to the wall gardens. Now that's like interesting. And I think they'll be able to build an interesting business out of it. But if you don't have enough of your own inventory, it's really, really hard to do the thing that's sort of magic about ads, which is you're selling digital hair and the margins are awesome. So what they're going to end up doing is selling, I think 
a lot of ads on O and O, but not uh, you know not going to be to the scale of a lot of these other platforms. And then they are going to be basically selling data for all practical purposes in a privacy safe way that can be used where all the ad inventory lives, which continues to be the wall gardens, whether people like it or not. And, you know, so I think that's interesting. Like, I, I feel like right now we're in a moment where the, the, the space and the industry is sort of like, everything sort of feels like it's almost going back towards the open web as opposed to the wall gardens. But, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, the wall gardens that are like, you know, in, in Andrew Cavado's words, but like fully walled, you know, that actually can close the loop they get to win pretty much like everything. So, yeah, you know, I think all this stuff has an impact on it and it will, it'll be interesting. It's, it's great that those wall gardens are like publicly traded companies. People can own parts of them. <laughs> and it, and it makes for really cheap or free services yeah. as we, yeah. as we well know. But I think, you know, you, you make a good point on the inventory side and like for anyone listening, like when you talk about inventory and selling digital air, you think about that as like Google search, they can insert as many sponsored listings in their search they own that page they can insert more ads monetize it more effectively facebook has their feed instagram has their feed and can just insert more ads to generate high high margin revenue right and the important part there again like the cost of showing an ad is like basically nothing at the scale that these companies are at so you're creating real estate out of thin air and then you're charging often via an auction that you have better visibility into than the other side. And so it results in just like a really, really good business. And and a great business over time if you've got billions of users. I think maybe going back to even Kroger and our last topic is there there is this proliferation now of retail media networks that we've talked about in past episodes, other platforms trying to to build you know, an ads DNA or some kind of ad tech internally. But kind of one byproduct of that has been this idea that if you don't have enough supply, so if you don't have those billions of users and kind of infinite ad space, using first party proprietary data and allowing marketers to use that to reach audiences elsewhere. So concrete example, Kroger customers through that loyalty program that you were talking about, Kroger can go to marketers and say, I know all these shoppers, I know their purchase behaviors. I know what brands they like. I know how frequently they buy these brands. Let me help you reach those those customers on Facebook, on Instagram, on Google, wherever else. And now Kroger has a, a data asset that is ads related, but they don't necessarily need the supply. And so maybe let maybe let's talk about how this idea of kind of data acquisition and proprietary first party data has has accelerated so fast and, and some of the areas that, that we've seen. I think the, the trend that you're kind of pointing out is that brands are effectively trying to bribe customers into giving them data. Then they can use that data and monetize it in different ways. And so there's, you know, a ton of examples of that happening and you know, obviously it's like a real bribe, but effectively, you know, you have, you know, you have retailers and airlines that are, you know, giving you discounts for signing up for their loyalty program. You have airlines, you know, Delta, for example, or I think is giving you free Wi-Fi if you sign up and basically, you know, help them build up that data asset. You have sports teams that, you know, offer people free tickets on their birthdays. And then, you know, I think you have other examples that have been popping up, one of which is this new startup called Telly, which is just kind of being honest about it and they're saying in the case of telly they're they're giving away free like flat screen tvs to people <laughs> and the reason it's free is that they're going to look at all your browsing habits and sell ads against it and so the tvs basically are like are two screens there's like a big screen which like looks like your normal tv and then there's like a screen at the bottom and that thing's going to show a bunch of ads and that is like an ex- kind of i would say like the most kind of in your face example of what's really happening here, which is, you know, these brands need to have a way to understand their customers and it helps them obviously like on their day to day, just like how they operate their business. But it also is creating a new business unit for them. Again, I think ironically right now, I think the thesis is, is that these brands will use this data and then use it to power open web 
campaigns and make that more efficient or use that to power connected to EV campaigns and make that more efficient. But like my thesis, at least, is that over time, even connected to EV, all this stuff is really just going to be going through the wall gardens. I mean, like YouTube is like eating streaming. So, you know, I think it all kind of leads back to the wall gardens in some ways, but it is like an interesting thing to see it happening. Like so, you know, commonly across some all industries. So for anyone that's listening that wants to go see a real example of this in the wild, Best Buy, Walmart Connect, Kroger Precision, these are the the advertising business units at these companies are outwardly positioning their products as an audience extension or leveraging in-store and online purchasing behavior that can be used on places like Meta or Google or the open web. And I think it really is an interesting trend that is accelerating pretty quickly, but it, to me at least, it, it, it's kind of harkening back to the original social networks. People were getting a free product that was really good. It was additive to their life, but we've heard now over the last 20 years that if, if the product's free, you're probably the product, right? And so it's, it's similar that, that these companies are essentially incentivizing, or as you said, kind of bribing customers in some way to share their data that is then just being monetized, just like it has always been on, on social sites or kind of other open web properties. Yeah, I think you know the the privacy changes have basically just made it where everyone has to be more transparent about how transactional they are for your data. So you know that is you know it's just going to be everywhere we look now going forward. There's just going to be you know this explicit exchange that is happening where a brand or a publisher is going to offer you something for your information. And I think for brands, it's not a bad thing. You know, I think that. It, at least it's like a, it's it's clear you know what the data looks like and how it's structured, and I think, you know, I do think though, and not to like just keep hammering this home, but it ends up being really good for platforms that are gigantic, and it tends to be that the platforms that are gigantic are these small gardens, social networks, the Amazon, and Apples of the world. Again, we haven't even really talked about Apple like in depth. I think that's actually something that we should probably do on you know, future podcasts, but like they really are set up to be a monster when it comes to ads and they don't have to do a lot of this sort of like trickery <laughs> to get data because they can do so much stuff on device and actually in a privacy safe way. Because if you have an Apple device, you know, it, it knows quite a bit about what's going on on its own thing. Yeah. I think that, that we should definitely deep dive in on another episode, bring a guest or, or someone on that, we can really dig in there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, to just kind of close it out, I think between what you saw at, at the Luma summit, I mean, this you know, proliferation of, of AI generated ad tools and, and data, it kind of is all kind of coalescing. Like it's all new and exciting, but at the same time, I don't know if you feel this way, but it, it just seems like we are going back to 10 years ago where audience data was really important. These different tools are really important and having good, good ad quality and context is really important. Yeah. I think that's probably a fair assessment. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, I guess with that, James, I think we, we started this two weeks ago, but what is your favorite direct consumer brand at the moment? I I gave mine last time. I'm curious to hear yours. William Murray golf shirts are awesome. For, well, no, I don't think everyone listening to this knows, but the, James is a, a big golf fiend. So that that's actually not surprising to hear that. And the, the shirts are awesome. They're so comfortable. People should check oh. them out. And it's all this, they're all, they're all referenced to Bill Murray movies. Okay. So with that, I guess anyone listening, go watch a Bill Murray movie, go watch the PGA championship this weekend. Enjoy your weekend and we'll be back next week with, with another episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you.